Singapore in the 1960s, a newly independent nation where industry and economic development were critical to survival. To help the fledgling industries, a different kind of bank was needed. Men and women with a pioneering spirit set a new course to transform the economic landscape of Singapore. From 1968 and right up to today, that bank has been catalyzing the nation's growth and development, always ahead of its time, blazing the trail with innovations and new ways of doing things. Being purpose-driven has been part of its DNA for 50 years. That bank is DBS. It was the first visit to Singapore for Queen Elizabeth II, among the state's gifts that Singapore's then-president Benjamin Shears presented to the royal family were three gold-plated roll-eye cameras. What was special about the cameras was that they were engraved with the words made by Roll-Eye Singapore to convince the hugely popular German manufacturer to move its operations to the then Young Island nation, the bank took a stake in the company, as the DBS pioneer explains. Roll-Eye was prepared to transfer the whole manufacturing activity from Germany to Singapore, manufacture the whole camera, not just do assembly. And we decided that there was a project worthwhile backing. We took equity in the Roll-Eye in Singapore. We took equity in the Roll-Eye in Germany. Investing in foreign companies was an unconventional move, but it was the bank's interpretation of its mandate. As the Development Bank of Singapore, its role was to help whole new industries get off the ground. At the same time, the bank was to help local companies upgrade and flourish. We saw ourselves as a national institution that had to take risks which others were not prepared to take. Our objective was not just to make money and be a bank, but to promote Singapore and to get Singapore to grow. Foreign investments in Singapore created employment opportunities and contributed to the massive industrial growth. The attraction lay in the young Singapore workforce, who now had new skills through the factories set up in Singapore, as well as overseas training. When I was sent to Germany for training, my parents just couldn't believe the opportunity that I had and uh, I was the envy, uh, envy of my friends because uh, the impression is like an uh, overseas training and uh, there weren't many opportunities to get overseas training. Over the years, whenever there's been change, DBS has been at the vanguard. From an ambitious project to develop the largest condominium in Singapore in the 70s, to pioneering the concept of anchor tenants and Japanese lifestyle investors in shopping malls. The development of Raffles City by DBS was one of the largest single commitments to the country's tourism sector in the 1980s. Project planning, however, started as far back as 1969. We calculated that the cost would be a billion dollars, which is a lot of money. And I remember discussing with Mr. Howe, who was the chairman, saying, should we take the risk of developing a project that's that big? What if it doesn't turn out to be right? It was a bold move by DBS to push ahead with the ambitious development. After years of meticulous planning, Raffles City opened in 1986. The mega project was a city within a city, consisting of shopping, a convention center, an office tower, and two hotels, one of which was the world's tallest at the time. The complex contributed to Singapore's emergence as a top convention destination. With Raffles City located just a stone's throw away from some of the country's historic landmarks, it helped rejuvenate the area. At the time, Raffles Hotel was a shadow of the luxurious vintage splendor that has now made it the crown jewel of Singapore's hospitality industry. Raffles Hotel was in rather a sorry state in uh, the late 80s. It was a historic hotel, but not loved and uh, respected by Singaporeans yet. It was a place where the tourists loved to go and where anybody who wanted to visit our part of the world would say, let's go to Raffles and see Singapore after that. Built in 1887, Raffles Hotel was one of the most fabled establishments in the Far East, attracting a glittering array of famous guests. At the ripe old age of 100, 
Raffles Hotel was gazetted as a national monument. This set in motion restoration work to return it to the glory of its halcyon days in 1915. Of equal importance was to engender national pride, and that began with the appointment of the hotel's first Singaporean general manager. When CBS Land decided to restore it, they also wanted the hotel to be a place that is respected, beloved even by Singaporeans. Then the people go there and have a nice evening. When we reopened in 1991, we had about 500 and some staff, except for I think five persons. All the staff were Singaporeans and Malaysians. It was truly a Singapore hotel from who is leading, who is working there, who are the employees and who are the people making it successful. Staying true to the mission of serving the nation. It was a national crisis. And DBS being the development bank, just have got to play our role. In the mid-1970s, competition for the highest and tallest was fierce among Asia's fast-developing cities such as Singapore, Hong Kong and Tokyo. The rapid pace of building in Singapore was most intensely felt along Shenton Way. This area was once a swampy, derelict seafront, but the completion of the DBS building in 1975 served as a catalyst for Shenton Way's transformation into what was then dubbed as the Wall Street of Singapore. Being the nation's tallest building in the 70s, it triggered a new era in property development that symbolized the country's progress. And it was the manifestation of one man's ability to think big. That man was Han Sui Sen. The DBS building was a small example of his preparedness to do things which were not just follow the trodden path, but do something new. We broke through the mental barrier of we cannot build high, and that enabled others to think big too. Because if you're not the first and you don't succeed, you can always say, well, you know, I'm just following DBS. DBS was set up by the Singapore government in 1968 to take over industrial financing activities from the Economic Development Board, or EDB for short. Hon Sui Sen, who was the chairman of the EDB, was entrusted to be at the helm of the new financial establishment. Very quiet man, doesn't make great speeches, but understands people and knows who can do what. Built a good team, and from EDB sprang TDB, Trade Development Board, sprang DBS, because we had to build up the finances to help people start their industries. This is not administration doing a job. This is entrepreneurship on a political stage, on a national scale. We changed the complexion of Singapore. Over the years, Han Sui Sen's entrepreneurial and trailblazing spirit carried through at DBS. Although the term disruptive innovation is common parlance in today's age, the bank was an early adopter of it. DBS Autosave, which was introduced in 1980, was a classic example. It was the first interest-bearing current account in Singapore. The concept was controversial and unheard of in the country at the time and drew the ire of other financial institutions. At that time, there was an agreement amongst banks that you are not allowed to pay interest on checking account. So we thought, why not? You know, uh, what was the reason? No reasons. And it got resolved by all the banks developing this product. We inspired everyone to follow suit. We had a lot of customers who applauded us, who felt that it was a good thing for, for DBS to bring the benefits to the customers. Being at the forefront of change is a recurring theme at DBS. The bank introduced the world's first electronic shares application service in 1993. This transformed the way initial public offerings or IPOs are applied for, eliminating the need for cashless orders to be cleared by banks. 
we came out with the first electronic service that allowed the customers to apply for an IPO through the ATM. That was ahead of the Singtel IPO, which you know was the largest IPO in Singapore. Because of the high oversubscription, the processing time to bring an IPO to market would normally be two to three weeks. Through our electronic share application, we actually reduced that three weeks to just two days. Banks are very keen to underwrite IPOs, not because of the underwriting fee. Banks wanted the float money. When we introduce electronic share application, overnight, there's no money for the banks to make right from the float. But it was a necessity for us to actually position Singapore right, to be a major financial centre, and we did it. Over the years, the bank remained true to its original mission of acting for the greater good of Singapore. In 1985, DBS was instrumental in leading a team of four local banks that set up a lifeboat fund to revive the country's stock market. The Singapore Stock Exchange had shut down for the very first time when Pan Electric Industries, a Singapore-based company whose stocks were hugely popular, collapsed. It was a national crisis, and DBS being the development bank, uh, just have got to play our role. I went to see Mr. Howe, the chairman of the bank, just to inform him that $6 million is the price that we have to pay to get a seat on the exchange. And I told him that if we restore investor confidence, the market uh, reopen, and we set up our uh, operations right, we should be able to recover that $6 million within uh, 18 months. And then he said, I, I hold you to your words. Lah. You can go ahead. <laughs> That's how Mr. How operates. Lah. The working culture at DBS fostered camaraderie, loyalty and pride among the employees, many of whom stayed for decades. I've been with the bank for 44 years. It's like my first home, not even second home. I have this, this feeling like, the branch cannot work without me. Like, sell program indispensable. <laughs> Most of us feel proud to be working for our own bank, DBS Bank of Singapore, and we will tell each other not to jump ship. That's why most of us stay quite long with the bank. In 2012, DBS moved from what used to be the tallest building in Singapore to an even taller building at the Marina Bay Financial Centre. Today, as a 50-year-old bank, it can boast of a unique journey of perpetually scaling new heights. It started as a Singapore institution, but DBS spread its wings and is now ranked among the top 40 most valuable banks in the world. DBS evolved to be a commercial bank and then it went one step further when it took over the Post Office Savings Bank, POSB, uh, which is a people's bank. So we took care of the man in the street. But then, of course, as we grew, DBS established itself as a very strong regional bank. And today, we are the largest bank in Southeast Asia. The quintessentially Asian dragon boat race is symbolic of the focus that DBS has on the region. It forms an integral part of the annual DBS Marina Regatta, which is Singapore's biggest bay festival. We brought a lot of life and activity to the bay. We have always emphasised that while we are global in mindset, we retain strong Asian values as part of our philosophy and culture. Embracing digital transformation and reimagining banking. If the customer can enjoy life more and spend less time on the chore and the hassle of banking, then that would be an ideal kind of banking outcome to create. Sachin Tendulkar, world-famous cricketer and India's favourite son. DBS pulled out all the stops to introduce a revolutionary new way to bank. Digibank is also India's first mobile-only, branchless, paperless and signatureless bank. 
We're able to add 100,000 customers a month. We're up to 2 million customers. And our cost of customer acquisition continues to come down quite sharply. And if the costs come down, then you can actually pass some of that cost benefit back to the customer in terms of improved terms and conditions, better rates, for example. We then took this idea and transplanted it into Indonesia, and uh, it seems to work there uh, as well. India and Indonesia have a collective population of about 1.6 billion people. Although the figures may seem daunting, the opportunity for DBS to access a large market through Digibank shows that DBS is playing a long game in both these countries and the region. We think that by staying Asian focused uh, in terms of business strategies will give us uh, the advantage and edge. And indeed, we have grown very well. There are no boundaries in digital banking. Registering for a Digibank account is done via an app and a mobile phone, leveraging on the main mode of digital access in Indonesia and India. DBS stays one step ahead by being not only a first mover, but also putting the relevant systems and infrastructure in place. Biometric verification for security is done at the customer's convenience, be it at home, the office, Digibank kiosks, or appointed cafes. DBS recognizes that in this day and age, banking needs to be simple, intuitive, and effortless. With that in mind, the bank that dares to be different held its first hackathon in 2014. Bankers were made to work alongside startups and propose new mobile banking solutions. We would put them in a warehouse for five days. We would give them a social problem or a bank problem to solve. And we gave them the mattresses, the ping pong balls, and the beer. The idea was to change the mindset and to make people believe that they could do this. The origin came, ironically, from a defensive posture. We started seeing the impact that the big tech companies were beginning to have in many places in the world. It also dawned on us that this could be a strategy for expanding in big countries, big markets, which we had found difficult in the past. In other words, we could be the disruptor in some of these markets. DBS has been deeply immersed in an all-encompassing digital transformation journey. This includes a revamp of the bank's technology infrastructure and leveraging big data, biometrics, and artificial intelligence to reimagine banking. Workspaces are also redesigned to encourage new ideas, collaboration, and teamwork. Our real estate department worked with individual areas of the bank to re-architect our premises to make them more open. We changed the way people collaborate with each other and tried to flatten the hierarchies so people could co-locate and work. Significant effort is put in to future-proof its staff to ensure that they can adapt to the digital transformation. At the same time, DBS also uses unconventional methods such as hackathons to recruit the best talent in the field of technology. But as a financial institution, enthusiasm for digital technology has to translate into profitability. And for Southeast Asia's largest bank with a presence in 18 markets, the transformation is paying dividends. We had a record year last year. It, of course, requires an effective business plan for the whole bank. But the digitization clearly expanded our customer base and enabled us to not just service our customers better, but reduce our cost and actually improve our own margins. DBS has twice been named the world's best digital bank at the prestigious Euromoney Awards for Excellence. It also clinched the world's best bank for SMEs award. Spearheading digital banking, DBS provides industry-leading solutions to help SMEs spread their wings regionally. To define its next phase of growth, it launched a Live More, Bank Less positioning in May 2018. This places a strong focus on invisible banking by seamlessly weaving financial services into the daily lives of customers. It's invisible to you because you're using our services as 
second nature is part of your lifestyle. Like you go to the hawker centre, you use Pela to pay. If the customer can enjoy life more and spend less time on the chore and the hassle of banking, then that would be an ideal kind of banking outcome to create. While we live in a fast-changing world and continue to reimagine banking, one thing that we remain true to is our sense of purpose, that we do what we do impacts lives and livelihoods. I wish DBS every success in the years ahead. May you continue to make banking simple, effortless and seamless so that we can all truly live more and bank less. Happy 50th anniversary. As it looks to the future, the bank is also championing social entrepreneurship to create a more inclusive Asia. The DBS Foundation was established in 2014 with 50 million Singapore dollars set aside to support social enterprises in Singapore, India, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan and Indonesia. Beyond funding, DBS also provides banking services, mentorship, and a platform for experienced social enterprises to share their knowledge. We focused a lot on the social entrepreneurship agenda. We do it because this is intrinsic to the kind of business we want to do, and we think this is what makes us relevant to societies and countries. From leadership in Singapore to leadership in Asia, and becoming increasingly known the world over, reinventing itself from the Development Bank of Singapore to the Digital Bank of Singapore. It takes a disruptive bank with a spark of creativity and courage to consistently evolve and redefine itself over half a century. Being driven by purpose is what distinguished DBS and the sense of purpose must continue to distinguish DBS in the future. If history is anything to go by, DBS will always dare to be different and embrace the entrepreneurial spirit long into the future. Brought to you by DBS. Live more, bank less.